Hey everyone, Connie here, and welcome to my first impressions review of The Sandman. So, for those who don't know, The Sandman is the newest DC Comics uh, television series, recently having debuted on Netflix. And yeah, a lot of people might not know that. The Sandman is DC Comics. You know, Wonder Woman, Batman, Watchmen, same thing. Um... So technically a crossover between Dream and The Flash is possible. Though obviously we'd need to find a new actor for the latter. Um, but The Sandman. The Sandman originated as a series of comics written by Neil Gaiman, who is known for other stuff such as Good Omens, um, American Gods, he wrote a couple episodes of Doctor Who, and is the creator of the classic story Coraline, which was made into a stop-motion film by Studio Laika. Um, and those latter two, Doctor Who and Coraline, are the big ones that I've always known Neil Gaiman for. Um, but recently, on this channel, I did check out the first episode of Good Omens, and American Gods is something that has been on my list. So maybe we'll check that out in the future too. Um, the Sandman we are doing a first impressions review on rather than a reaction or anything because this is something I definitely wanted to check out on my own time. Based on the trailers and stuff that I saw, it was something that I, I, I wanted to be able to sit back and relax to. Sort of like Stranger Things. Uh, when season four released semi recently, I wanted to be able to like lay back in bed at night and put on an episode. Just like every night or every other night, just lay back, put on an episode, relax to it, and just enjoy it for what it is without having to worry about, you know, reacting to it. And so last night, um, I did the first episode, and yeah. It was different than what I expected, but in a good way. Now, I have never read the comics, so I'm not familiar with the source material. I'm not familiar with this story at all. I didn't know what to expect going into this. Um, all I knew was what I had seen in the trailers and I guess a basic synopsis that I had heard of it. So... I went into this not knowing what to expect, and it surprised me. Because the first episode very much is a setup episode. It's giving you the, not the full, like, backstory on the characters or anything, but kind of giving you a glimpse at what is going to set this entire series into motion. The entire plans for it, the ideas, the concepts... It gets you into it without really starting anything yet. And I think that's what caught me off guard. That there really wasn't much that happened in this episode. That it was mostly just set up. And again, I didn't mind that, honestly. I felt that... I. Ooh, excuse me. I feel that setup episodes can do wonders for shows. There's a lot of people out there who are very impatient and think that every episode right off the bat has to be balls to the wall, has to be constant action and excitement, and they hate when a series slows down or takes time to focus on character and the depth of the world rather than action and exciting uh, set pieces and stuff. Um, the Ruby fandom is very infamous for this. Um, but I, for one, have always been a fan of this. In fact, I think some of the best stories take these moments to slow down because it allows them to develop more properly. Um, and so this definitely gives me a lot of hope with that. So, in order to go 
into the story of what this is going to be about, I feel like I'm going to have to go into a little bit of spoilers here. In fact, probably quite a bit of spoilers. So, I'm going to give you this warning right here. Um, probably the rest of this review will be talking about the events of the episode. Talking about what happened within it. Um, as specific as I really end up getting. Uh, so if you have not seen the episode yet, uh, just my general thoughts are I really enjoyed this. I thought the acting was great. I thought the cinematography was great. I uh, really liked the direction and the soundtrack for it. Like, really worked well. Um, and, and again, with it really setting things up, not much happened. But all the pieces are in play. And we get enough of a glimpse to really, to really whet our appetites. But, now we will go into spoilers. So once again, if you have not seen episode one of The Sandman, I would suggest doing so, unless you just don't mind spoilers. And in that case, um, we'll begin with those spoilers in three, two, one, now. So right off the bat, I recognized an actor in this. Um, I actually didn't know if there was going to be any actors in this I knew. But right away we kind of get one that I've seen in a couple things now. Um, even if only partially in one of them. So let me explain. Let me get to that. So the story centers around Dream. The embodiment of Dreams. The titular Sandman. Um, he is the creator of all dreams and nightmares, and the controller of such. He lives in a realm of his own creation, in which he creates and controls the dreams, and if any of them escape into the waking world, he has to go and basically fetch them um, to stop them from affecting things. Now, uh, normally, a dream cannot live not not dream is in him but a dream is in a dream cannot live in the waking world for long but a nightmare thrives in it and they use that word thrives not just survives so whenever a nightmare escapes it's kind of of the utmost urgency that he go and capture it well one such nightmare does escape um, and it's seemingly, from what we can tell, not necessarily more powerful than any others from our knowledge, but still a notable threat. And it's really interesting because usually when you get this kind of thing, usually when you get, uh, these kind of characters in this kind of show the 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 threat the villain is usually a lot more intense and i guess you could say scary someone who's a legitimate threat but here not as much so at least not right off the bat it seems like uh dream can handle handle him very easily but that also might just be because dream you know created him we see dream catch up with this nightmare named corinthian which by the way is a fantastic name for a villain um i assume it's based off the biblical book of corinthians uh which in and of itself was named after the town of corinth um so i wonder uh, corinthian was a citizen of corinth so I wonder, like, if, if there's meaning there. There probably is. Um, but he seems to be able to handle him too, super easily, to the point where Corinthian is basically begging for his life. However, at this same moment, uh, and this is all taking place in, like, the early 1900s, by the way, at this same moment, a... Uh, sorcerer and cultist named the magus um elias would be upset at that um is 
about to perform this ritual. See, this, this doctor comes to his house and tells him that it's like, I've come to you for help because you said you could br help bring my son back and everything. And the Magus, who, by the way, is played by Charles Dance. Yes, this is the actor I was talking about. Charles Dance, I have seen as Tywin Lannister in Game of Thrones, as well as uh, one of the bad guys in Godzilla. Um, specifically, King of the Monsters. Um, so that's fun. Um, although I haven't seen, like, a lot of Game of Thrones, um, I do know of him in that, so. <laughs> there is that. Um, and, and I recognized him right away. Like, the, pretty much the instant I'm looking at him, I'm like, that's, that's Tywin, isn't it? It's funny, because I, I always forget his, like, the actor's name, so I always just call him Tywin. Um, because that's the first role I knew him for. So I'm like, that's Tywin, isn't it? And I'm looking at it like, that's got to be him. And I'm waiting until the credits. And once like I, once I'm done with the episode, I find out, like, yeah, that's that's him. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm watching the entire time, and it's like, is that him? Could it be him? <laughs> or am I just mistaken and thinking that's him? Maybe he just looks like him. But no, it was him. Um, but yeah, he is uh, also mourning the loss of his eldest son and is also planning on bringing his son back using this black magic ritual. There's no other way around it. So he agrees to help the doctor as well, and with the assistance of, well, his servants and his younger son, who he is excessively abusive to, by the way, um, he performs the ritual uh, with the doctor there to spectate. Um, and it works. Unfortunately, he was trying to summon death. You know, the Grim Reaper, basically, as death would have the ability, presumably, to bring back their sons. Instead, while Dream is trying to take care of Corinthian, he suddenly gets summoned by this guy and is just basically ripped through space and time well more space than time and into the clutches of this magus allowing corinthian to go free and wreak his havoc do murders and all that fun stuff um while Dream is now trapped within a ceiling circle on the ground. Think of, like, the the ceiling circles uh, you see made of, like, salt and stuff and Supernatural. Kind of like that. Um, so, captured, they steal Dream's uh, artifacts, his cloak, his helmet, his, his ruby, and his bag of sand. All of these have these mystical properties to them that we're definitely going to go into more in the future. We, we only get, like, kind of a glimpse at what they can possibly do in this. Or not so much a glimpse, but so we're, we're kind of told a little bit. Um, and it seems that they're probably very, very powerful. So either way, uh, Dream is stripped basically naked and has to lay there just as a prisoner. Eventually, Corinthian comes and gives uh, the Magus advice on how to more properly contain Dream, even telling him wh who Dream is in the first place. Uh, one of the endless, basically a primordial being, um, who is beyond dangerous if let loose. Um, even bringing up this idea that if released could possibly kill um, the Magus. So the Magus ends up trying to make deals with uh, with him, trying to 
get him on his side and get him to, you know, bring back their sons, as was the idea. But, upset by his imprisonment, and obviously being able to tell that this Magus is not a good dude, and considering the Magus also is constantly asking, and honestly more so asking for stuff like riches and immortality and all, Dream basically just ignores the shit out of him. <laughs> um, we get to focus a lot more on, on uh, the Magus' younger son at this point. Um, and we kind of get to see that he's not as bad about things. Um, Alex, the younger son, is a lot more empathetic towards dream and we see that as dreams crow who was transported along with him ends up bothering the magus for 10 years 10 10 years pass at first um alex is older at this point um presumably like 18 or so somewhere around that because uh, I, I think in, in the first part he was like maybe 8 eight to 10 maybe. So 18 to 20 he would be at that point. Um, maybe. I, I'm not even confident in that. He could be younger. Um, but either way, he's, uh, he's tasked by his abusive father with taking out the crow that, you know, he couldn't take out for 10 years. But he's like... Telling his son, it's like, oh, you, you do it. It's like, if you couldn't do it, why do you expect him to be able to? Um, the crow ends up coming in the house, starting a fire to distract, uh, to distract the guards, and going down into the basement where Dream is being kept to try and free him. However, Alex does notice this, and with the shotgun his father gave him, does end up killing the crow, uh, whose name was Jesame, I believe. Um... And, yeah, it's like, it's it's pretty bloody, like, it's just right off the bat with the killing of the crow and everything, like, he shoots it, like, dead on, and it's a pretty notable, like, splatter of blood. And you can see, like, you can see the shock on Dream's face when that happens. It's like, just shock and horror, because Jesme is, you know his friend basically so seeing a friend be killed like that so violently but at the same time it goes back to alex and you could see him like with the gun and everything and he's he's scared he's very clearly scared he's very clearly upset he didn't want to do it and even when told to dispose of the crow's body he instead of just throwing it in the trash he carries it away, presumably, to bury it more properly. It's made very clear that Alex is not his father. So, eventually, Alex and his father end up getting into a fight after Alex finally confronts him about the abusiveness, and he accidentally kills him. He shoves his father against the glass stone that Dream is trapped in, and the back of his head hits it in just the right way where it splits his head open and kills him. Um, it, it's, it's a really sudden death, and I feel like it almost would have made sense. Like, the, the dome, it's not just pure glass. Like, there's, like, rivets and stuff on it and, um, like, these little wraparound uh, things holding the dome. And it's, I feel it would have made more sense if his head, if the back of the head instead of just hitting the dome straight up it hit like one of the like corners of the wrap around uh things it just would have made more sense for splitting his head open like that but it's not a big deal it's not a big deal at all um he dies and alex who at this point had begun a relationship with uh i guess i think he's like supposed to be a gardener or at least uh working for uh working for the Magus in some way. Um, but they start a relationship. Uh, the, the guy's name is Paul. 
and it's made clear that he and Alex very much loved each other, like very much uh, were really uh, very much a strong couple. <laughs> uh, ship goals. <laughs> um, so Alex kind of takes over watching over Dream and trying to get information and stuff out of him. Um, he introduces Paul to to Dream and tries to tries to tell Dream and tries to convince him he's not like his father that he just he wants to help but we also see that he's also scared he's afraid to let Dream out because he's afraid of what could happen if he does he's afraid that he and Paul could be in danger so he wants he wants a promise from Dream that he and Paul will be safe that they will not be hurt unfortunately Dream is completely untrusting um after especially after alex killed uh his his crow after he killed jessamy even though it was very obvious alex didn't want to do it dream is just not trusting of him at that point and in narration even admits maybe he should have been um and then we have a massive time skip because it jumps ahead to almost a hundred years later over a hundred years after Dream first came to uh, the estate. Um, now, over a hundred years, Paul and Alex visit Dream one last time. Alex is confined to a wheelchair or at least a cane most of the time to get around. Paul helps him get around, um, them having been a loving couple for a very long time. Um, and so, one last time, asking Dream, just promise me and Paul will be safe, and I'll let you out. And, and making it very clear that he wants to let him out, even. But Dream still doesn't trust in him. So, they head out with Alex saying it's going to be the last time that they ever come down there. And while heading out, while wheeling Alex away on the wheelchair, Paul ends up wiping away some of the ceiling circle that was keeping Dream in there. And the way, Al the way Paul looks back and everything, the way he looks at the ceiling circle being rubbed away, the way he looks at uh, Dream, I feel it's very much intentional. It was something that he, he actively chose to do. Um, that wasn't the look of someone who just did something on accident. Um, so they go away, head out for the night and everything, while the guards who are currently posted there end up basically accidentally setting Dream free. One of the guards goes to sleep, and with the ceiling circle broken, um, going to sleep is a way for dream to escape because he can escape through people's dreams um and he does so he escapes and as punishment for um everything for being trapped for a century dream puts alex into eternal sleep and Based on this, what, what the series clearly is showcasing and all, I do not think he means full-on death necessarily. But throughout this episode, there's this, uh, because Dream has been taken and everything, and, uh, you know, he's no longer there to handle all the dreams and nightmares. Um, there have been a bunch of people throughout the entire world for this last century that have been struck with a sleeping sickness where they fell, fall asleep and cannot wake up, or in some cases, just cannot fall asleep. And I think it's something more similar to that. Based on the wording, based on what it's kind of given us, I think that's more what, of it's, what it's going for. Um, dream heads out goes back to his realm where he finds his um his, 
I guess you could call them his assistant. Um, but they tell him what's been going on, show him that the realm is not in good shape since he's been gone, and that he basically needs to help fix it now. We cut to seeing Corinthian again, who, by the way, his eyes are mouths with teeth, and it's really unsettling. Um, he's just killed someone and is clearly being set up as our main villain of the series. Um, who knows how much more powerful he's gotten over this century, how many people he's killed and everything. So that's going to be interesting to see. So a lot of this, a lot of this seems to be set up. It seems to be presenting us with what the main core of the story is going to be. Dream trying to restore the dream world, while also you know capturing all the nightmares and uh, dealing with basically restoring the balance of things. Um, that seems to be the main goal. All this stuff with the Magus and Alex and all was a nice starting story but it's over <laughs> the magus died um his, his part of that is over his son is put into eternal sleep unable to be woken up by even his husband paul and that story is done except for one thing there's one thing i purposefully left out there's one more player in this story that i didn't mention yet when alex was young um he was dealing with some people who wanted to get into his father's mansion and all and a woman came up and helped him get rid of the unruly crowd who weren't able and weren't wanted to get in um, this woman ended up going in to meet with the Magus herself and ended up forming a relationship with him. As the years pass, we see that they are, I wouldn't call it a romantic relationship, but there's very clearly a sexual relationship to it, as at one point she gets pregnant. Unfortunately, the Magus, who, like, you know, all of this was done because he wanted to bring his eldest son back in the first place, isn't interested in any more kids. He's already abusive and hateful towards his youngest son. He, he doesn't want any more new ones to worry about. So he tells her that she has to abort, basically. He even calls the doctor to get it set up. Um, you know, just another old white man trying to control the body of a uterine person. So, fun. Very relevant. Um, very fucking annoying. Um, but because of this, she ends up escaping. She runs away. And she steals all of Dream's artifacts. The ruby, the, the helmet, the sand, the bag of sand, everything. She steals those and leaves. And it's unclear if that was her original goal, if she had planned to steal that from the start. I'm thinking probably so. Um, it never actually explicitly says, but it, I feel like otherwise there's just very little to her character so far. But if that was the case, it feels like this was all a setup and she had planned this from the start and it makes it seem a little more interesting. So I want to believe that's the case. Um, but yeah, so she leaves with all the stuff. Um, the Magus had ordered her to be brought back, but he dies and she never is. She ends up nine months later giving birth to a son and basically promising him that these artifacts will help keep them safe and healthy for a long time. And that's kind of the last we see of them for the moments. We don't know what happened to them after, you know, all the almost a hundred years. Um, so who knows what's going on with their bloodline at this point and what's going on with the artifacts. That's something that, again, is being set up. That's something that is a 
cog in the wrench for Dream at the moment. He doesn't have his artifacts. He doesn't have the full extent of his power. So it's going to be really interesting to see how all of that is taken care of. Um, so what do I hope to see going forward in this? Well, obviously I want to see what the other uh, primordial beings, the Endless, are like. Uh, we get the mentions of them such as desire and death in this, and it's like, yeah, I want to see them. I want to see their personalities. I want to see their characters. I do know that some of the characters are gender-bent from how they're portrayed, um, at least how they are um, physically and in terms of presentation-wise, how they're presented within the comics. Um, and Neil Gaiman who uh helped work with this uh with the crew on this series was all for it he had no problem with it and even defended the decision against uh so-called fans who were hating on it and you know being pieces of shit about it so if the creator of the comics is okay with this all then no one can fucking say a thing. It's his story. <laughs> um, I do know that, though, so I'm wonder. I, I don't know exactly who is an example of that here. But yeah, I just, I know that's a thing. Um, I also know that there are characters who appeared in other DC comics prior to the Sandman's release that do appear in the comic run of the Sandman. Um, I don't know who, but I do know that there are other DC comic characters in this. So there is kind of that crossover element. Um, I don't know if they appear in this series. I assume probably, but I don't know for sure. Um, and yeah, I'm very interested to see what they do with that kind of stuff, if they do. Um... I want to see, obviously, follow up with the woman and her son. I want to see Corinthian continuing to, you know, be a psycho killer in the streets and everything. Um, and I want to see Dream having to deal with getting everything back and how tricky of a situation that's going to be. Um, I also do know there's at least one kind of mythical creature in this, because that was in the trailer. So there's that. Um, I don't know how many other kind of creatures are going to be in this, but we'll see. Um, like I said, though, this is just the first impressions, so we're going to have to take it as it goes. And maybe if I feel like I have enough to say... At the end, when I finish it, I'll put up a final review. Again, if I feel I have enough to say at the end, um, if I feel like there's something I can put forward with a review. Otherwise, I might just leave it at this. <laughs> um, but obviously, I, I might post uh, stuff to my, um, to my Discord server, so if you want to join the Discord, and haven't already link is in the description below um just a bunch of nerdy shits on there sharing sharing nerdy shit talking about nerdy shit that kind of thing um but yeah i'm very much interested to see where this goes it was a good start gave us a lot of good character building and world building and just really really went really started strong even if there wasn't a lot going on, even if there wasn't a lot of action, it, it still started strong. So tell me your thoughts on the first episode of Neil Gaiman's The Sandman in the comments below. And for now, I'm Connie and I'm signing off. See y'all next time.